A5, AKA Young's Point Road. And Kim has lived in Lakeville since 1967, at which time he and his wife Kate purchased the old Payne home across from Lakeville College School. In 2007, Rosemere Manor will celebrate its centennial. Kim has worked very, very hard this past year researching the history of this amazing landmark. So uh, what I would like to do now is uh, have Kim give us the uh, very intriguing background of this particular place. And at the end of this talk, uh, we will introduce you to some of the guests who are here with us this evening, and they may have some extra little stories to uh, tell us too. All right, we would like to start then, Kim, with uh, you giving us the background about the piece of property itself from 1800 up to 1900. Could we have the first, the first the slide, please? All right. <laughs> uh, I thought that uh, people uh, might not know exactly where the uh, Rosemary Manor is, so I drew a sort of rough map showing you that uh, here is County Road 29, and here's the branch going off to Bridge North. At the first intersection, you come to the old Young's Point Road, and as you go north on the Young's Point Road, this is north, this direction here, you pass a stately building set back from the, the road uh, after a long aisle with trees planted, and that is Rosemere Manor. The property, includes the southeast quarter of lot 25 of the township and the southwest quarter of lot 26. That, that property uh, came into the hands of Robert Preston uh, at around 1900 and uh, we'll, we'll take it more or less from there. Now the township of Smith which uh, that map refers to, uh, is part of 1,950,000 acres of land purchased by the Crown from the Aboriginal dwellers for 750 pounds paid annually. I've worked that out roughly over 200 years that it comes to around 15 cents an acre. That's pretty good buy. In 1818, the property was, not this property, but Tante Smith, was surveyed by John Houston, who surveyed most of it, but uh, left some for Richard Birdsall to finish. Boy, would I have ever loved to work on that <coughs> survey committee. The, to see the country as it was in those days. The, the uh, survey has little notes here and there, like this one, black ash in the hollows, maple, beech, elm in the uplands and black ash you don't find anymore at all. Um, maple beech and elm beech would be 500 years old. Some trees with branches like that. It would really be something to see. Well, in 1823, the, the southeast quarter of Lot 25 uh, was uh, granted by the Crown to Joseph Clark, and uh, the southwest a quarter of Lot 26 was granted to William Clark. And from that time on, it passed, they passed through a number of hands. Uh, I think there must have been a lot of land speculation in that time, because uh, some of these deeds were only for two years. But <clears throat> at one point, both properties were held by Thomas Steele, whom some of you may know from uh, the elegant uh, the tombstone paint a marble tombstone in the uh, in Christchurch uh, graveyard. It's the outstanding tombstone there. He was a gentleman farmer on the seventh line. But eventually, uh, the property came into the hands of George Preston. Now, George was a younger brother of Alex Preston, who came to Lakefield in 1832 to manage Harriet's Mill. Alex later bought 200 acres further north 
this way uh, along that road and built that fine stone house that you see there. It's now owned by the Sigmas. George willed his property to his children, William, John, Mary, and Sarah. John died and his, his share went to William. And when it was apparent that the county wanted this land, the sisters released their shares to William as well. And on 20, the 3rd of April, 1906, William sold the land for the House of Refuge and the, the, to the corporation of the county of Peterborough for $6,250. William and his two sisters moved into number 16 Nelson Street in, in Lakeville, mm -hmm. where they lived until the last one died in 1920. Now, if one visits Nelson today, one will find lots number 14 and 18, but no 16. However, the space between 14 and 18 is very large, so when they died, they must have made some, some, some arrangement to take over that property. Thank you, Kim, for, for that era. Uh, please tell us now what happened from 1900 to 1920 when the house was first built. Okay, things begin to happen now. Uh, the, the active ingredient of this uh, part of the uh, history is an edict that begins, whereas, pursuant to the provisions of 3 Edward VII, Ontario, chapter 38, it is necessary for the county of Peterborough to erect and establish for the said county a house of refuge for the reception of persons of the classes in section 526 of the Municipal Act and amendments thereto. Now, I have no date for this edict, but since Edward VII came to the throne in 1901, it probably came into force a few years later, say 1905 or 1904, in which case the response of the county was commendably rapid. As we have seen, the land had been bought from William Preston the preceding April. The persons referred to in Section 526 of the Municipal Act are those who, through age or infirmity, were unable to support themselves. Many of the so-called Bernardo children fitted into this category, at the turn of the century, the Bernardo children and adults made up about one-third of a percent of Canada's population. In April 1906, uh, oh, just before we do that, I'll, I'll read you the bylaw that they then passed. Uh, a bylaw number 889. A bylaw to provide for the issue of the ventures uh, to the amount of $30,000 for the purpose of establishing a house of refuge in the county of Peterborough. What they had done, they'd gone out for bids, and uh, they had uh, put out requests for tenders in the Examiner, and the Review and Times, the Layfield News, Norwood Register, and Havelock Standard. And in April in 1906, the, the county had formed a special house of refuge committee chaired by H.C. Garbutt to plan and build the necessary house of refuge. The plans for the house were provided by John E. Belcher, a Peterborough architect engineer accredited by the Ministry of Education to design and build schools. Not surprisingly, the plans were for a school building. There are many advantages to this. One, the cost of design was minimal as the plans were already existent. Two, the plans had already been used for schools. Queen Alexandria, Lindsay Central, uh, Central Senior. Lindsay Central Senior is a dead ringer for this, this building. At least the front the facade is. <coughs> I've got friends from Lindsay, so I have to talk to them. <laughs> uh, so on May 1906, on uh, the 17th of May 1906, the tenders were opened by the committee, Mr. Garbutt's committee. And the Bathy brothers of Lakefield had quoted a price for this building of $18,093. James J. McPherson of Peterborough had quoted a price of $18,134. The difference is only $41. I don't know just what was going on there. 
moved by Mr. Shaw, whom we shall meet later, and seconded by Mr. Webster, that the Baptist brothers be accepted. They were $41 cheaper. <laughs> it was carried. That motion was carried. Now, W.J. and G.A. Baptie were the sons of Peter Baptie, a carpenter and builder who came to Lakefield in the mid-80s and built many of the village homes on Regent Street, including the large gray brick family home at the corner of Regent Street and Baptie Lane. It's now apartments. The House of Refuge Committee met several times between the beginning of April and December 1906 to settle various matters including the plumbing, wiring, and heating of the building that the Baptists were putting together with commendable speed. The county found it necessary to issue further adventures to cover some of these items and to furnish the building. The speed with which it was going up was a further indication that the design had been used before. It had been decided that red brick was to be used throughout the, the building. The bricks were furnished by the Curtis Brothers of Peterborough who had works on the Autonomy River. Uh, and they had a, a capacity of uh, about half a million bricks a year. Uh, and they had delivered to James McPherson. Now James McPherson was the, was the contractor who lost the, the bid. But they apparently he had a subcontract with the Baptists to do the brickwork. Very comfortable arrangement. If I lose, you, you, have, you're my, you have a, a, a contract. If you lose, I have a contract. Uh, anyway, uh, the only hitch in the proceedings was that uh, the Charles, I'm oh, sorry, the Curtis brothers were afraid that the county was not going to pay them for the bricks. They had delivered two, two thousand, two hundred four hundred forty-seven thousand six hundred and fifty bricks to the James McPherson, uh, the fellow we men mentioned earlier, and uh, they hadn't been paid for these. And so on 11 December 1906, Charles Curtis, of the Curtis brothers, proceeded legally against the county. He, he put on the county what's called a mechanic lien uh, for, to, get, to get paid uh, for the sum of $970.76 that was due to the brothers. The county paid up three days after Christmas. <laughs> kind of dirty. <laughs> Meanwhile, <clears throat> the county had passed on the 1st of December a bylaw 906, nine, sorry, 904, to provide rules and regulations governing the House of Refuge, which had now become, under the bylaw, the House of Refuge and House of Industry. This wasn't going to be a holiday for anybody. <laughs> <laughs> and and, and uh, yeah, that, that, that's what it's called. Uh, the regulations on committees and admissions stipulated that the house would be accessible to anyone without means for maintaining themselves so long as they had been resident in the county for at least two years. No idiot, consumptive, or insane person would be admitted. <laughs> cancer or any infectious diseases would, would prevent admission. No child between the ages of 2 and 16 would be received as an inmate. In the event that a child was born of an inmate, the child would be given to the charge of the Children's Aid Society upon reaching the age of 2 years. Uh, I think they maybe relax that a bit, we'll see, see later. But each municipality let me see here. Oh, yes, here we are. Each municipality would pay 50 cents a week toward the maintenance of any member sent as an inmate of the House of Refuge. A board of management consisting of this county warden and two members who might also be members of the county council would be appointed every year and would report to council at the January session on the expenses and earnings and other matters pertaining to the previous year. A superintendent was to be hired by the county to oversee the operation of the house and the adjacent farm and devote any spare time available to tilling and cultivating the farm. He was also to inflict punishment on any inmate guilty of violating the house rules. The list of the duties and responsibilities was long 
and gave the superintendent enormous powers over the lives of the inmates. A matron was also to be hired by the county to take charge and over oversight of all the indoor operations of the house. Note, oh, a previous bylaw uh, had already established Henry Beavis as superintendent and Jane, his wife, as matron. A physician was to be appointed and paid by the county whose duty it was to supervise all matters of health and hygiene. He was to report yearly to the county council on all matters pertaining to the health of the inmates. Now we come to the rules for the inmates. Every historical reference to the House of Refuge dwells upon the rigor of these rules. The first of this series of rules set the tone for them all. Paragraph 40. At the ringing of the morning bell, every inmate, the sick and those in confinement accepted, must rise, dress, wash, and be in readiness to proceed to work. Now I made a note here. Those in confinement is a telling phrase, for there was a jail with bars on the windows maintained in the corner of the basement where inmates might spend time for having broken the rules. And depending upon the severity of the charge, <laughs> nourishment during confinement might be limited to bread and water. <laughs> Paragraph 41. The bell will ring ten minutes before every meal, when all will leave their work and will be in readiness, with clean hands and faces, for the ringing of the second bell, when they will repair to the dining rooms and take such seats at the table, at the table as are assigned to them, by those in charge, where they will maintain silence, decency, and good order. Now, among other sundry regulations, there are a lot more regulations like that, but among the sundry regulations, there, there's this one, paragraph 58. All persons willfully absenting themselves from the place of meeting or violating the Sabbath day shall be subject to prompt and severe punishment. Now, visitors, Paragraph 65. The house will be open for general visitors on Thursday of each week, etc., etc. I don't need to go into all the detail of that. But the first set of visitors, it's kind of interesting, on 1 January 1907, the construction had been completed. They began at the end of April, or beginning of May, and by January 1907, the building was finished, which is pretty good at any time. The visitors register of the House of Refuge recorded the names of visitors for the official opening of the house on 1 January 1907. Construction had been completed in a little over six months from the opening of the tenders. This represents an achievement even by modern standards. Among the visitors recorded in the register were Miss Eugenie Grills, that's John Grills' aunt, Jeannie, Mrs. Levi Payne, who lived in the house where Kate and I had, Mr. R. M. Graham, Mr. J. J. Bickle, Mr. D. Darling, these names may mean something to you, Mr. James Jory, Mr. H. C. Garbutt, he was the chairman of the committee, Mr. J. W. Botterill, that was Jack Botterill, who had the planning mill on the uh, cemetery lane there, and Mr. Walter Medill, Mr. E. Millage, that was Ed Millage, the father of the Millages here, and Mr. W.J. Charlton. What the visitors saw is shown in the next two slides. This is the House of Refuge as it was open, uh, seen from the southwest of the building. The next one. The same uh, building seen from the southeast. You'll see at the, at the end, end of the building there is a door which uh, lets into the basement, and there's a similar door on the far side there. Can we see the, the, the next one, please? This is the front view, and the men's wing was uh, on the right side here, the north side. The women's wing was on the, the left, the, the, the south side, and both wings had their own kitchen and dining room, and the, the doors between them were locked all the time. 
So the men and the women were completely segregated. There was to be no fraternization. <laughs> <laughs> the jail was uh, around the corner, the back corner of the building there, and it looked out on that side of the, the property. Now, uh, the <clears throat> front steps lead up to the first floor, which is the second row of windows up. That's just about the way it would be in a school. And then there are steps going further up to the, the, the second floor up there. And this down here would be all the, in the basement. That was the basement. And you had to go down from the upper floor to get down into the basement or get into from one of these end doors here. According to, to Gord Young, who was very interested in historic history, as you know, both Gladys Chapman, do any people remember Gladys? Yeah. And yeah. Pearl Goodall, they remember, remember Pearl, yeah. remembered people wondering why they built a school in these empty fields so far from the village. They <laughs> thought it was a school, everybody thought it was a school. <laughs> now, to a newcomer, that entrance must have looked like a great maw about ready to swallow something, some, some poor individual. On 29th January 1907, there was a visit of the first board of management consisting of uh, Patrick McNulty of Norwood, who was the warden, uh, Robert Shaw of Harvey, and uh, Robert N. Scott of Smith. Uh, the visit was commemorated by a framed collection of photographs that, are still, that still hang on the wall what is now the third floor of Rosemary. Yes, can we see that one? There we have uh, Robert Shaw. We've, we introduced him in more detail later. There's Patrick McNulty, and there is uh, Robert Scott down there. Uh, Robert Scott had the reputation of being a, a great teetotaler, and I think he has kind of an expression of a teetotaler. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Of the three, only Shaw, Robert Shaw, was closely associated with the House of Refuge right from the beginning. He was on all the committees. He, did, he was always making, we, we had a motion uh, earlier, I read to you, that he made, and he was very active in the whole thing. And for some reason, I feel he was behind the rather punitive regulations. He was a small man, you know. And, uh, I, I suspect the small men, generally. <laughs> there, the, the next picture, there's shown, there is uh, McNulty, and there's Shaw in the middle. And you see, he's a sh shorter than the women, he's two steps up from McNulty, and he's still below McNulty. And, and there's, uh, there's uh, Scott, Robert Scott. Now, uh, I said that the, the um, superintendent at this time, in 1907, was uh, Henry Beavis. And I spent yesterday morning with Ralph Beavis in town trying to figure out who these people were. These three people all have Beavis faces. But, and, but that chap at the end there, beyond the dog, can't be Henry Beavis. But there's no question in... Ralph's mind that this lady here was the matron, Jane Beavis. So we're trying to, to find out what the, the composition of that photograph is. <clears throat> now, the next pictures show you there's the, the male inmates are all posed on the, on the steps of the, of the building. And uh, the one after that shows you the female in in <coughs> mates on in the building. Now, there are a couple of interesting features here. This lady in the, in the corner holding a baby on her lap is Lena Pearson. And she's only uh, 23 years old at that time. And she's an inmate with all these old people. And the other baby is held by Eliza Payne, you just see the head of the baby there, and uh, those babies are twins, and they're 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 probably they're Lena's tw twins. So in the next picture, you see the see the babies there. 
this uh, this is the the sister, and this is the brother. Now the brother is destined to spend his whole life in the, the house of refuge. His name is Jim Pearson. Her name was Linda. What did I say her name was? Lena. Lena. His name is Jim Moore. Sorry, Jim Moore. And he's destined to spend his whole life in the house of refuge. So, I want to find out what happened to Dulina Pearson and what happened to her daughter. They may have gone into service. She may have gone into service and take the daughter with her. And they may, must have made some arrangement for Jim to stay on because he's, he's lived his whole life there. Now, the House of Refuse, as I say, was not for a holiday. It was for work. And uh, it was built on prime farm farmland and was intended to be self-supporting. And just to give you an idea of what they had, the cash book shows that by 1954, which is quite a bit further on, uh, they had an inventory of one team of horses, seven cows, nine two-yearlings, eight one-yearlings, six one-week-to-one-month calves, eight fat hogs, 160 heads and 20 roosters, 40 tons of hay, 10 tons of straw, 25 stooks of corn, 450 bushels of oats, 300 bushels of wheat, and chopped hay mash. So they were, it was a, a real production. Okay, Sandra? <laughs> yes, Kim. That, that uh, time sounded to be quite busy. What, what comes next in the history of the house from 1920 to 1940, Kim? Right, right. Okay. Next period, 1920 to 1940. Uh, the examiner of 18 June 1921 published a report to the county council of, uh, of the grand jury stating that there was a need for several uh, general house cleaning of the House of Refuge. Now the grand jury was something that had been set up uh, over the years to, so that uh, anyone in the, in the, uh, was an inmate would have someone from his, his uh, uh, township uh, represented him on the, on the jury. I haven't said that quite right, but you'll get the general idea. Uh, and here's their report. This was in 1923, 21, sorry, 21. This is only about uh, 15 years after, after the, the house opened. We found things in general in bad shape. <laughs> the walls and woodwork are badly in need of repairs. The plaster is off in several cases, and three closets are out of repair. The chairs are not suitable, and ones more comfortable should be provided for the old people. Another, another paragraph, we believe the arrangement of things in general could be improved. In extreme cases, patients should not be confined to the attic of the house. There was no heat up there. We would recommend the complete destruction of most, if not all, of the mattresses. And the most modern method of fumigation applied so as to make the same fit to live in. That's what they said, live in a mattress. The grand jury urged that the report produce action instead of being filed away without attention. Now Henry Beavis and his wife were no longer superintendent, his wife Jane, and matron when this sorry state of affairs was discovered and reported. These positions were held by Fred and Mary Bullied. The Bullies came from the Apsley branch of the family and they're not related to our former Reeve at Lakefield. Their tenure at the House of Refuge gives rise to an incident that is one of the stories of the house. Young Jim Moore, whom we left as a baby, had become a strapping 18-year-old who worked in the barn with the horses. Mary Bullied had taken a liking to the boy and made much of him. Maybe the only mothering that he had. Her husband, was a bully by nature as well as by name, and at times could be very hard on his wife, whom he made to work in the barn as well as in the kitchen. 
Jim Moore happened upon a very ugly scene between the two of them in the barn, and he tore into Fred Bully, throwing him into the pig barn, and just about killing him. <laughs> this is according to Sherman Edward. Bully retaliated by having Jim certified and sent to 999 Queen Street in Toronto. They kept him there for a year, and having decided there was nothing wrong with him, besides being a little slow, uh, sent him back to the House of Refuge. The bullies by then had been replaced by Mr. and Mrs. John Vise, Fry's, sorry, John Fry's. Someone had given Jim a pair of policeman's trousers with a red stripe down the side, which he wore with great pride, claiming that he was a policeman. <laughs> and we'll return to him again later. In December 1923, the examiner published W. Duggan's report on a visit to the House of Refuge under the headline, quote, they have weathered the storms of decades and cast anchor at last in a peaceful haven where best of care helps closing years. That's us. <laughs> Twenty, listen. <laughs> Ed Arnold should listen to this, you know. <laughs> Twenty-seven souls there are which have endured the stormy blasts of decades and now in the sear and yellow leaf of their lives Late autumn, they linger, some with the fires of desire still touched, some with some semblance of the courage that drove them forward. How about that? <laughs> Another one. Through the blue-gray fumes of tobacco smoke, old men see the picture of what might have been. They are again limbed in reality, portraits of the past, and exchange these precious views with friends who understand the pride of achievement, and the poignancy of failure. As I say, Ed Arnold doesn't write nearly that well. <laughs> the examiner well. of 19 March, 1930, 19 March 1930, published an account of the Peterborough County's oldest man, James Henley, a resident of the House of Refuge who was celebrating his 108th birthday. We have somebody 98 years of age, but that's as far as we've gotten so far. <clears throat> and the re examiner, re reporter, takes flight again. He said, quote, The glory of the day, however, is a trifle marred by the fact that the old gentleman had been forced to spend it much against his wishes, resting in St. Joseph's Hospital in this city with a slight weakness of heart. But his illness is not serious. Mrs. Fry's matron of the House of Refuge hastened to assure the examiner yesterday. So it continues, with unabated interest, the old centurion continues to watch the stream of life whirl and eddy by through clear blue eyes that yet do not require the assistance of spectacles. He walks with a firm and straight carriage, a cane he uses, true enough, but even this is not absolutely necessary. Somebody asked him if he'd ever smoked. And he said, yeah, I began smoking at age 10. So he'd been smoking for about 100 years. <laughs> The Examiner of, of 3 January 1939 published the highlights of the preceding year. This I, I thanked uh, Shirley for, uh, including an account of the wedding, wedding of John Doc DeRemo and Hattie Williams, both over 70 and both residents of the House of Refuge, who defied the regulations promulgated by the county, eloped, and were married in the home of the minister, F.W. Craig. We see that picture of them? Oh. Wait at last. <laughs> uh, F.W. Craig, who had to assist Happy, and he's assisting her there, with the signing of the register. The tensions of the experiences that had, had been such that Hattie could not remember how to spell her, her name. <laughs> it was no use. Hattie just couldn't do it. And signing had to be put off to a later date. <laughs> It's about, it's about this time that Ralph Millage remembers shooting groundhogs on the house property 
in company with their young Fry's boy. Fry, Mr. Fry's gave the boys a nickel for every groundhog they killed and moreover provided the ammunition. And Elaine Byers, who worked in the, in the house, said that the place was alive with groundhogs, but she had a house on the eighth line and used to walk across the field to the, to the, uh, the house of refuge. So of course she saw them. Uh, when, uh, oh, uh, when I first came to, to Rosemere, we found a groundhog climbing a tree. <laughs> I wrote a little article in the, in the, in the paper about that. At Rosemary, the groundhogs climb trees. Uh, and we, we still have groundhogs. We have, I, thought, I thought they'd gone, but this spring they'd come out again. Then the small one was only this, this big last fall, it's about this big now. It was also about this time that Ed Millish, Ralph's father, installed a tin ceiling in the house kitchen. Sandra? It sounds like a lot happened during that era for sure, Kim. What uh, stories then can you tell us about what happened in the building from 1940 to 1960? Right. 1940 saw Mr. and Mrs. Bruce Garbett take over as superintendent and matron. Their son, Wellington, known in Lakefield as Welly Garbett, lived with his wife Ruth on Samus Drive in Lakefield and he's been a help to me. There now begins a time of relative ease and well-being at the House of Refuge. Donna Peacock, who had, had loaned me a photograph of the House of Refuge dating from the 40s and 50s. And the building had begun to look more like a resort than a House of Refuge. <laughs> the, 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 cavernous, the cavernous entrance is still there, still there, but had been modified by building a sunroom on the roof of the entrance and taking away the tunnel-like appearance and tying the entrance more intimately <coughs> into the building. Donna's mother, Marg Greystock, worked for the Garbets, and here is a picture of her at a picnic given for residents and friends at the back lawn of the house. The little girl with the impish expression and the bow on her hair is Donna Peacock there. Now Donna knows some of those people, but I, I don't have their names. I seem to have seen that, that lady who's holding the teacup to her lips. I've seen her somewhere. Uh, the lady, the other side of her, is, uh, is that not uh, Price Morris that used to be the policeman here? That's his wife. I'm Could sure be. it is. Could be. <coughs> oh, the scene contrasts with the grim impression of the House of Refuge left by the rules and regulations promulgated by the county. The reality could still be grim, however. At the insistence of the grand jury, a room separate from the general population was used for those in the last hours of life. This was the boardroom, to the left of the top of the entrance, and the windows were heavily draped for the occasion. Dave Butterworth remembers when his father and mother took over as super superintendent and matron, they had somebody dying in the boardroom. There is a plot in the Lakefield Cemetery reserved for those who died without family connections. I have not yet seen it, but I'm going to be looking at it very closely. Now, Jack and Marg Butterworth took over in 1951. She was an English war bride whom Jack had met and married when overseas during the war. He was a Barnardo boy, and like so many of them, signed up for service when war was declared. Their management saw the end of the use of the jail in this building's basement. Dave and his friends used to use it for playing cowboys and Indians. <laughs> Within two years, the Butterworths had been replaced by Albert and Lila McConnell, who were destined to remain in charge for the rest of the time that the House of Refuge stayed in the hands of the corporation of the county of Peterborough. And, as it is called, and Lila were well known and well liked in the Lakeville community. Lila was a fantastic cook, according to Donna Peacock, and Lila was also an IODD officer and arranged for the daughters to give picnics and outings for the residents. Ed came from a race of big men, and his son, and he's in Lila's son, Robert, was also large, so large as to be known as Diesel at school and in the community. 
He and Dave Butterworth were close friends, for Jack Button Butterworth had built a home on the property just north of the House of Refuge. Oh, I stopped the map. I couldn't, couldn't see it anyway. House of Refuge. Mark Butterworth went to work as a secretary at Lakeville College School, and Albert Branscombe, who we have at the, at the, at the uh, Rosemary Manor, uh, remembers her. He was, a, he was a bursar then, and he said he was a very nice English girl. That's all I have at that. Thank you, Kim. I understand that during the period from 1960 to 1980, there were several changes that took place. Tell yeah. us about that period of time. Okay. This period saw the House of Refuge cease to be the, the project of the Peterborough County and transfer into the private, in the private hands. Our friend, Jim Moore, whom you've met already, now in his mid-60s, had an accident which apparently triggered the county's decision to get out of the business of running the House of Refuge. Jim was riding on the back of a farm wagon when it bounced over a bump and threw him up on his head, breaking his neck and killing him. Thus, his entire life had been spent at the House of Refuge, except for the brief stay in 999 Queen Street. For the county, it brought home the fact that it would be necessary to carry insurance for this sort of thing, and that this would tip the financial balance out of favor to the county. Bruce and Phyllis Black had taken over from the McConnells in 1976. The McConnells had given 25 years of faithful service as superintendent and matron, during which the House of Refuge had remained financially viable, if not a positive source of income. <laughs> the county presented the McConnells with a ceremonial plaque in recognition of their service. And Donna Peacock brought this plaque to Rosemary, and uh, we're going to present it to the new owners to see if they would like to put it up someplace in the, in the Rosemary. The McConnell tenure, though generally very successful, was not without criticism. When Dr. McMillan was examining uh, the examining physician, he gave the house a clean bill of health, but he was sufficiently concerned about the treatment of the old people that he asked his registered nurse, a local woman, to spend a week at the house to observe the treatment of inmates. Needless to say, she wasn't very popular with the McConnells, and they weren't very popular with her, and she gave a rather negative report. But you wonder whether she really fully appreciated the difficulties of looking after old old people, like us. It, it's difficult to talk quietly and politely to someone who can't hear. And it, and it was, was true that many argue was permitted to sit in only one chair in the building, but then she was incontinent. Uh, also, I, I, Donna told me, she used very colorful language. She could swear like a trooper for a lady in those times was, was quite unusual. Uh, the blacks carried on the tradition of the McConnells, but it was clear that the House of Refuge was up for sale. In January of 1979, the blacks took the plunge and bought the House of Refuge from the county for the sum of $70,000. Between 1979 and 1981, the building was extensively rearranged. It was completely gutted and refinished. We have a copy of the application to the township for plumbing dated 11 April 1979. The estimated cost was $40,000. The owner, Bruce Black, gives his address as 299 Westgate Crescent, Rosemere, Quebec. And this apparently was the source of the name Rosemere. And from this point onward, we refer to the House of Refuge as Rosemere Manor. Sherman Edwards got to know the blacks well and tells the story of Al Crow, the local fire marshal, who was giving Bruce a hard time with the renovations. Bruce scheduled a general fire inspection to which he invited a third party. When Crow said he would never give a permit to the establishment, the third party chipped in and said, on what grounds? Who are you to ask, says Crow, and finds that he's talking with the chief fire marshal of the province, who had come from Toronto for the visit. 
It was impossible to reach an agreement on what was permissible at, at Rosemere. What bothered, what bothered Crow, and this is very, very, very true, what bothered Crow was a central stair leading up from the basement through the building. In the event of a fire in one of the kitchens, the stairwell could act as a flue and set the whole building on fire. The solution adopted was to have a heavy steel door capable of sealing off the top of the basement stair, held back by restraints of uh, low melting alloy, which would melt them at low heat and let the door down over the opening. Thank you, Kim. Now please bring us up to the present date from 1800 all the way up to the year 2000. Yes, ma'am. Mm -hmm. Well, it gets a bit complicated here. I'm not, I'm not completely confident that I have things right, but uh, this, is a, this is the way I see it at the, at the present time. Uh, when the, this is eventually published in the uh, uh, Trent Valley uh, Journal, I'll have everything, I uh, hope, in order. I'm going to be visiting uh, next week, um, Vern Tuesley. Oh, I'll, 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 I'm a little ahead of myself. <clears throat> in June 1981, the blacks sold the remodeled Rosemere Manor to Vern Tuesley and Associates for $423,377.50, the Bank of Montreal holding a mortgage. Vern and Eileen Tuesley operated the manor from 1981 to 1986. It was during this period that the first flagpole was installed in front of the manor. And we have a newspaper clipping showing a photograph of the ceremony attended by John Turner, MPP for Peterborough, and Gordon Joy, the Reeve of Smith Township. Mrs. Turner and the Tuesdays are in the photograph. They, they are in the flagpole behind them. And sometime later, and, and, and this wasn't done by the Tuesdays, they, they said it was done by the seniors. That means us, I guess. And sometime later, the number of poles was increased to three, and the choice of three flags was brilliant. Where a single pole must have given the impression of an institution, the three vertical white lines made by the poles carry the eye up to the front of the manor to the decorated facade at the top and, and reinforce the impression made by the face of the building. We do not have much information about the Tuesley's term of management, but as I say, we are going up next week to see Vern and, and maybe fill in a lot of this. In 1986, Vern Tuesley and Associates sold the manor to a numbered company, 645647 Ontario Incorporated. And it was under this ownership that major changes to the building were made. The entrance stairs were removed, and the entrance was made directly into the, the ground floor. But the gaping front of the entrance was enclosed in glass up to the second story to give an attractive surface reflecting the trees and shrubs in place of that gaping hole. In February 1987, an elevator serving the three floors was installed. The central stair remained as it had been left by the blacks. The manor was operated by a firm in Oakville, Complete Healthcare Incorporated, as part of a stable of six retirement homes in the province. Things were going well, and Rosemere was breaking even in spite of the heaviest expenditures uh, that I've just described. The mortgage was still held by the Bank of Montreal, though the account was managed by the Imperial Bank of Commerce in Lakeville. On 20th June, 1990, disaster struck. The rug was pulled out from under Rosemere. The CIBC declined to meet the payroll. The manor was to be closed down. The 28 residents and 19 staff had 24 hours to vacate. Although Rosemere had been doing well, the controlling firm of Complete Healthcare was being bankrupted by the other retirement homes under its control. The trauma of getting 28 seniors packed and moved can be imagined. Donna Peacock says the staff stayed on without pay just to help with the move. Ida Watson remembers the nightmare of getting her father, Albert Weiss, who's an old friend of mine, and his wife out of their suite and into temporary quarters. Many of the seniors were removed to, Rose, uh, were to, removed to Peterborough Manor. Rosemere Manor was to remain empty for two years until it was bought by Richard and Marilyn McCarthy 
of Peterborough. Richard had the idea of transforming the two upper floors into independent suites. He says, I spent six months researching the building, and the more I researched, the more I found what I wanted to do could be done. When he opened the front door, the manor had stood empty for a little over two years. Everything had been left just as it was when the building was closed. The beds were still made, only the windows needed to be opened for the stale, musty smell was everywhere. With Richard Tucker of the firm of Rood Moulton, Richard designed 11 individual suites, five on each of the upper floors and one on the ground floor. Each suite is self-contained and gives the resident complete independence. And here's a picture of Richard, who's in the audience. He looks even better than that now. <laughs> but do you see the, see the effect of the three flag poles going up? It takes your eye up the, up the building. <clears throat> the first resident was, uh, poor Richard, I think, went for a year without being able to put somebody up. But the first resident was Frank Coyle of Lakefield, who had been waiting impatiently in a retirement home in Fred Peterborough for the operation to be completed. Many others followed. Richard and Marilyn <coughs> operated Rosebeer successfully for 12 years. There came a time, however, when it seemed necessary for fresh energy and fresh ideas to be injected into the operation of the manor. In June of 2005, this is after I arrived, the McCarthy sold Rosemere to John Crawford and his sister-in-law, John Joan Garnier, a <coughs> uh, registered nurse, both of Toronto, though John's business experience had taken him to Australia and New Zealand. Under their direction, the matter had taken on new life and promises to continue in the tradition, tradition established by the McCarthys and perhaps expand. Our last picture shows the matter upon the occasion of the November, uh, November 11, 2005 Remembrance Day service on the front lawn. Many of you were there. Uh, <clears throat> you don't see him, but Al Branscombe, our 98-year-old resident, was a, a bugler, a cornet player, with the Royal Canadian Air Force Band. And, uh, but he, he left the band and um, was one of the few uh, ratings in the Air Force was invited to become an officer. They couldn't pay him enough if he stayed in the ranks. So they, he made an office of him because he was so useful. But um, uh, for years since then, he'd been playing the last post um, on a bugle or on a, on a cornet. But at 98 years of age, he found the task beyond his capabilities. And Glenn McMullen of Warsaw played his trumpet for the occasion. The three flags were lowered simultaneously to half mast by the members of the Lakefield Sea Scouts. You don't see them at the post, but we have a picture of them right coming down. Uh, and raised again at the end of the ceremony after the last post. And Rosemere provided an impressive background for the event. You can see in this picture the, uh, the effect of glassing in that, that great gaping uh, opening. It makes it very, very pleasant. January 1, 2007, will find Rosemere Manor 100 years old, and plans are afoot for a centennial year next year. Stay, as they say these days, tuned. <laughs> as part of the centennial, this history will be published uh, in, in, in full in the Prince Valley Archive Journal. Now, I owe a great deal to many people, and I'm just going to go quickly through the acknowledgments because they should, be, they should be mentioned. First of all, Richard McCarthy, because he got me interested in it in the first place. He supplied some of those wonderful photos. Lang Village Archives, the, they, have, they have the visitor register for, for the book of uh, the House of Refuge. They have the account books. They have the um, uh, medical reports uh, in their archives. Very, very interesting. The Trent Valley Archives, Elwood Jones, Professor Elwood Jones, who's just recently retired. Diane Rubnick, who's uh, the secretary of the archives. Wonderful for finding, they find fake people for you. Gina Martin, 
it may, many of you may have seen her Christmas story in, in the uh, Examiner. That um, she was very, very helpful. The Corporation of the County of Peterborough, the clerk, Lynn, Lynn Clark, and Meg Hughes were very, very helpful. They supplied me with, with, uh, with photocopies of minutes of meetings and so forth and so on. And um, I couldn't have done any of this without uh, that help. Now, there were a lot of individuals, too. I'm afraid I'll miss somebody, but I'll tell you the ones I've got down here. Sherman Edwards, who lived right next to the, he lived across the room from, from there. Donna Peacock, who's been absolutely wonderful. Ida Watson, Ralph Beavis, Gord Young, Lois Keller, Al Branscombe, Elaine Byers, Connie Orr, Willie Garbett, Dave Butterworth, Vern Tuesley, and Mary Smith and Sandra Wilson. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Kim. Your research is just absolutely overwhelming. I can appreciate all the hours and hours of time. Oh, hours. <laughs> uh, it wasn't that well, it, it was quite fun. <laughs> and that's what made it so extremely interesting. Be, be, besides the very uh, enlightening stories and the wonderful, wonderful photos, that really helped bring this beautiful building alive. What I would like you to do now, though, Kim, is to introduce some of the people here who are our guests, who in oh, some way are Before related. I do that, may I make, make a, a short announcement? Absolutely, it's I'm, your night. I'm putting my card at the end of the table here, and if this talk has tickled any memories that give you an idea that you'd like to tell me something, Please take a card that has all my 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 address and so forth on the back of it. Thank you. Sorry. Yes, and if when uh, you introduce each person, Kim, if they would stand so that we can see them, and then after you've introduced each one, perhaps uh, some may have some memories or comments to share with us too. And if they do, I'll just turn the, this microphone over to them. First of all, I'd like to introduce my friends from Lindsay, my very good friends from Lindsay, Don Van Halfen, Esther, his wife, and his son, Scott. Would you please stand? <laughs> and secondly, I would like to introduce the new owner of Rose Beer, Mr. John Crawford. <laughs> You see him. Uh, I would like to introduce uh, uh, the lady behind Scott there, Hannah Laura Jurgen, a friend from Bridge North. <laughs> and behind her is the famous and unforgettable Donna Peacock. <laughs> What else have I got here? Oh, uh, this isn't fair, you know. Rick McCarthy. Oh yes, Rick McCarthy. I'm sorry, Richard. Stand up. And Marilyn. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mary. Are there any other people here or guests that we have not acknowledged? Now, uh, from all these wonderful guests that are here, welcome. Uh, we're so pleased to have you. It, are there any of you who would like to j just say a few comments about Rosemere? All right. Marilyn warned me not to. <laughs> but I don't always do what my wife tells me to do. <laughs> no, I just thought I'd like to I'd like to say that uh, when I had seen Kim, uh, when Kim had described that it took me about six months before I finally had enough nerve to 
uh, take the plunge and to buy Rosemere when it was in a state of disrepair as it was. Uh, but we had been um, involved in different rental properties around Peterborough, and the things that had attracted me the most to Rosemere was that it was a solid brick building, it had good storm windows, it had a new elevator put in, um, it had, uh, didn't have a furnace, there were a few vital things that were missing as well, but it was a, a building that I felt was a, uh, had very good possibilities. Um, I think the people that lived there, and the, the reason that I did want to get up and say something, is that when people decide that they want to live at Rosemere, they're either very excited about it and take it on as being their own home, uh, and Kim is a sterling example of that. Mm -hmm. From the time that he first saw it, from the time that Frank Coyle first saw it, uh, Frank was, a, Frank was a, a great inspiration to me when I was building it, because he would come around, he was staying in Applewood Manor at the time, down in Peterborough, he so anxiously wanted to come home to Lakefield again, and his favorite story was that when he first came to Lakefield, um, before he'd started his trucking company, he, um, he worked at a grocery store, and he used to deliver groceries over to the House of Refuge at the time. And he used to joke all the time, and he used to always say, when I get old, I'm going to live in that corner of the building right there. And then when he did move there in his retirement, uh, he delighted in telling everybody that when he was a young man, he said where he was going to live one day, and I'm exactly in the corner of the building where I said I wanted to be. <laughs> his was, by the way, the very first suite that was rented, and he did get the pick of all the suites. Um, I did have the idea that when I finished one floor, that everybody would want to move into one floor while I could work away on the second floor. Uh, and I found out that people do not like to move into a retirement home that's a construction site. So <laughs> it was about a good year and a lot of stress trying to get the building to the point where it could be rented. But uh, it was a, a, a very important stage of Maryland's in my life. and. Uh, um, Marilyn and I found that we became very attached to the residents that are there. As I know John and Joan are now, you become very close with the people that are there. And um, I'm very pleased to see it being carried on the way it has been. And I think it's a very important part of Lakefield to have a retirement home like that. So, thanks very much. I bet you everybody wants to go home to bed quickly, so I just have a few things. But first of all, I want to thank this guy because he's been fantastic. He's been the inspiration. He's been the guts behind this thing, and uh, he's the guy that's making it work. So, uh, Kim, thank you, sir. Oh, you're welcome. Not only just that, he is an unbelievable cook. <laughs> Just keep it there until, until I'm ready to go. Okay. <laughs> yeah, well, well, a couple of things about that, trying to keep it there until you're ready to go. First of all, Richard, I don't know whether you noticed that, but like there were some numbers floating around there that were like $15,000 and $6,000 and $18,000. I don't know what happened to you and I, but <laughs> those are the numbers I've been dealing with. <laughs> I, I've been kept very quiet about those numbers. <laughs> That's right. They're, they're in print. They're in print. And yesterday I was caulking the windows, and I counted the bricks, and I'm a few bricks short of the 247,000. <laughs> right? so I'm sure that's where that saying came from. How did you ever find enough time to do that? <laughs> I know John is 96 windows. Yeah, that's good. <laughs> oh, I believe it. I got six of them done yesterday. <laughs> The one thing I did notice in, in Kim's speech is that I think we've been really, really slack on the rules. So probably tomorrow morning we'll get some of those old rules. <laughs> 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 and, and we're down to 10 people. And I noticed there was 28, so you don't mind sharing your room. <laughs> well, right? that's not a, no, that's not a contract. <laughs> <laughs> okay. uh, just a bit of fun, but uh, I'm really serious about this. Joan is... Um, uh, Hundred-year-old buildings are tough, tough to run, and uh, I can't hammer a nail straight, so it's been a little rough. Uh, Richard was a lot handier than I am. 
But our vision, we do have a vision for Rosemere. We want to keep it the way it is, but we have to expand it. So I guess I need to ask everybody in here for their ideas on how we do that. So how do we add 20 or 30 rooms and still make it the same? Because that's our commitment. So we have two choices. We can charge everybody three times what they're currently paying, Oh yeah. Or are we going to add more rooms? <laughs> <laughs> so Kim's had some good ideas, and I think, you know, working with the community, uh, I think we'll have some ideas over the next little while. You know, we've talked to Mary, and, and, and Sandy's keen. We want this to be the future of Lakefield. We think it fits. Uh, we love the place. Uh, the groundhogs are back. <laughs> There's 10 geese sitting out in the field yesterday. But no, it is a wonderful spot. I really enjoy it. Kim said that I had spent some time in Australia. In my last business in Australia, I owned a, the very first distillery on Australian soil in Ballarat, uh, Victoria. It was 150 years old. It was, it, it was built to service the gold rush in uh, Victoria 150 years ago and subsequently got f uh, flooded out. But anyway, I lost my shirt, it's the, it's, the, it's the short story. But it was a fantastic property, we had 200 acres, it, it reminded me a lot of, of Rosemere. So on a smaller scale, uh, this one's going to work, this one's going to work. So uh, uh, thank you all for coming tonight and uh, I'll let you go. Is there anyone else who would uh, care to uh, share some thoughts? Donna? Donna. <laughs> well, Mr. Kidd over here was the one that phoned me to remind me that the Peterborough County home, as I know it by, uh, was going to be turning 100 years old, and he got me in touch with Kim. And we had some really good conversations back and forth. Um, yes, there was a jail there. And yes, the doors were locked when I, my mom worked there as a young girl and met my dad and moved back to Warsaw. And after five kids, my mom decided to go back to work and back to Peterborough County home again. Um, my other brothers and sisters were um, in school and my dad was working on the farm, so he couldn't really watch me, so I got to go with my mom. Uh, the McConnells became my aunt and uncle. Robert <laughs> became my big brother. And right to his last day, he was always my big brother. Um, and he, her, Mr. Er, aunt Lila, to me, um, niece used to come out and stay with us in the summertime and she was just a few months older than I was and the one day we decided the ladies used to watch the soap operas from 12:30 to 1 o'clock that was their break and it was back when the 15-minute shows were on and in the jail used to be all where the paint used to be and they would clean their brushes underneath the, a windowsill. So Susan and I decided, hey, if they can paint, we can paint. <laughs> so we decided that we would paint while well, they were upstairs, not knowing what we were doing. And in the process, we decided that we would venture away from the windowsill and go into the jail cells. And they had fire engine red paint. <laughs> and we drew great big happy faces in the jails. Well, then Uncle Ab would always give us some old blankets and the clothespins, and we went around to all the fences, and we made tents and things like that. Well, we were in our tent when Aunt Lila found a jail. <laughs> and Aunt Lila came out to the sun porch on the lady's side, and yelled at us. And we let on we didn't hear her. <laughs> well, eventually we did poke our head out and she took us back to the jail and asked us if we did it. And of course we said, yeah, we did this. We thought it was pretty. Well, the next morning at seven o'clock, we ate our breakfast 
got our paint clothes on, and we had to go in and repaint the whole jail. <laughs> and the tin ceilings that Kim mentioned was in the jail as well. And they were all real fancy <laughs> scroll work tin. And Susan and I had to paint and paint all those bars <laughs> inside, and no drippy paint either. Those were, that was just one of the stories that I can remember. Um, Dave used to come home and drop into the county home on Friday night after work. And I always got to be the, the waitress. And one night, Dave came home and Aunt Lana says, why don't you go make Dave a sandwich? And so there was tomatoes and bread and butter. And I went and asked him if he would like lettuce on his tomato sandwich as well. Well, yeah, that would just be lovely. So out came the sandwich of the tomatoes and the lettuce and a little bit of uh, uh, bojack mayonnaise at that time. And he crunched away at the sandwich. And he's crunching. And Aunt Lana said, there's something wrong with your sandwich, Dave. It's just a little crunchy today. Well, I realized I had put cabbage on the sandwich. <laughs> but as soon as I walked back into or drive up that driveway, um, it's like going home to me. Um, after my kids got into school, I proceeded to go back and work myself at Rosemere. Um, got to meet and was there when it reclosed again. Um, was there for the auction sale after when the county sold it. And uh, so there's a lot of memories with the, the county home and Aunt Lila and Uncle Ab and Robert. And I thank you for letting me have this time. Well, thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, would anybody else like to share any thoughts or memories? I know that Harold, who I call Hermie, Hermie and I went through school together with Deza McConnell and we have um, very special memories because we were all three angels, weren't we, Hermie? <laughs> so um, he, he was a very special, very special person. So um, that, that was nice to hear a little bit about that era for sure. Um, did anybody else who wasn't uh, uh, mentioned have any questions which they w wish to ask or any comments? Um, I, I've had the pleasure of going over to Rosemere Manor and uh, having lunch with Kim. And while I was there, I had the pleasure of having my own tour of Rosemere Manor. And uh, I've already got my dibs in. I just love it. As you know, when I lived in the home in Lakefield that was built in 1888, I absolutely loved that home. And I thought that they'd be taking me out of there in a pine box. So when I saw Rosemary Manor, it reminded me so much of the Sharon home that I lived in with the beautiful high ceilings and beautiful big windows and so seriously, um, could we get a gang together? I'm sure if we put our names in now, that place will rock. <laughs> it will be great fun, but it, it is just so homey. Um, and I'm sure that you are more than welcome to go and have a tour and see the place, because it is. It's a beautiful place. Uh, we are so pleased and proud to have such a beautiful landmark in our village. And um, as I say, let's keep that place going. Right, Herbie? Right on. Our time will come. <laughs> <laughs> so again, Kim, thank you so much. Yes. Yes, OK. So thank you very much. We oh, certainly you. appreciate that.